So I never know when we're live. Now, I, I think we're probably live now, but we're going to wait until we're 100% sure to really get into the meat of it because I don't want anybody to miss out. And I know that people really want to hear what you have to say today, Chris. So here we go. We're live on Facebook. Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Hellickson. And uh, welcome to Club Wealth TV uh, with my co-host, Miss Cherie Benjamin. And as you guys know, Cherie uh, kind of gets by in the real estate business on her meager uh, 500 units a year. So she'll survive this year, fortunately. We're all grateful for that. Uh, and so that said, I love having Cherie on. She brings a great perspective to Club Wealth TV. And we're super excited about our guest today. Today, we have with us Mr. Chris Heller. And I got to tell you something. Chris Heller is no freaking joke, you guys. This guy right here, I long time, and I don't, I'm, I'm afraid to even say how many decades ago it was that you and I originally met, Chris, but it was a long time ago down in a mastermind. Actually, it was held at your office. Uh, the, the one I think that you and I originally met at uh, was down in your office in San Diego. And uh, it was great. We had all kinds of great agents there. We had, uh, I know Jay Kinder was there, and Buddy Blake was there, and Curtis Johnson was there, and I can't remember who else. There's about 25 of us. And uh, everybody in that group ended up doing very, very well uh, in real estate. And you, Mr. Heller, went on to become the CEO of the largest real estate company on the planet, Keller Williams. And, uh, and over time, you decided for one reason or another to leave Keller Williams. And now you're the CEO of Mellow Home, which we'll get into that a little bit later. But first and foremost, I just want to say thank you for being with us today. It's super exciting to have you today. Uh, my pleasure. I am live. I am alive. Uh, <laughs> People have wondered, man. We get, you know, it's like everybody keeps asking, "What's going on with Chris Heller?" Like, I never hear from him anymore. Where is that guy? Yeah, no, it's still, still, um, still alive and kicking. And my, and I still have my team. This is the, uh, in fact, this is our thirtieth year of the Heller, the home seller team in San Diego. So they're still down there selling houses and and uh, helping lots of people with their real estate needs. And, um, that is awesome. Good for you, man. I'm super stoked about that. Uh, so how many people do you have on your team down there now? There's, uh, I think there's 11 or 12. Yeah. So you've, you've done a great job. I'm going to be honest, you know, you're the first time I ever saw stand up cubicles was in your office and that it inspired me. I literally, as soon as I saw that, I'm like, Oh, screw this, man. I went home and I literally built out a 15 station stand up call center. Literally the following week, I was so inspired by it. And dude, let me tell you, game changer. It was awesome. Yeah, I've been uh, I've been standing for thirty years actually. And when I first started, I brought in um, cinder blocks and raised. We had these just regular desks, right, with the cubicle walls in this office I was in. And I brought in cinder blocks and raised the desk up so I could stand up. And uh, and I've been standing ever since. <laughs> I'm still standing. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Your feet must be exhausted. So, <laughs> but 30 years of standing up, see, and most people have just started to figure this out. And now it's, it's crazy. In the last, I would say, year, it seems like all these stand-up desk companies have come out. It's like, what took them so freaking long, right? I yeah. mean, how does it that they just now are figuring this out? And all of a sudden, they're everywhere. And everybody's like, oh, my gosh, it's an epiphany. And, you know, this, you know, the, 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 the millennials invented this. And I'm like, no, no, Chris Heller invented it. Long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but you know what's funny is you see all these stand-up desks now, like you said. But all, what you also see are these are these high chairs. So people are still sitting; they're just sitting at a higher level than they were. It's like, wait a minute, that's sort of defeats the purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Way to call it spade a spade, man. That's awesome. But you're totally right about that. It's like, dude, if you're gonna stand, stand. If you're gonna sit, sit. But don't try and you know stand sit or sit stand or whatever you want to call it. But uh, dude, we've got a lot of people watching right now already. And uh, and speaking of which, I see we got Ray Meyer, Kathleen Beasley, Amy Freeman, a bunch of Club Wealth coaches are on right now. So welcome, you guys. Terry LeBlanc, it's good to see you guys. So type in your questions for Chris. But I want to start off, and we've got a lot that I want to cover with you today, Chris, and we've only got about 48 minutes left, 49 minutes left. Um, and, but I want to hear everything from how you got started to what happened throughout your career to, you know, the whole, you know, you ended, how'd you become the CEO of Keller Williams and, and why did you leave? Like everybody wants to know, what happened? Why Chris leave? And then how did you end up at Mellow Home? And really importantly, one of the things that we got to cover while we're on the call today is I want to know what you think. And I want to save this for the end, but I want to know what you think about where the market's headed. I want, I want to know what do you think agents need to do to compete? What you think of all these third-party companies coming in and, and really dialing in, uh, you know, pieces of the business and taking certain pieces away from the agents. 
Um, but for now, let's talk about really quick, how did you start in the business and what did that look like? What did your first decade in the business? I'm, I'm going to break it down by decade because you and I have been around since, well, real estate was invented. And so start with that first decade. How did you start off? The, um, all right. So there's a little, all right, I'm going to go fast. So I, um, I got my real estate license. I was a sophomore in college and, um, my dad called me near the end of my sophomore year and said, hey, you're going to get your real estate license and come up here and, and sell timeshares for the summer. And up here was Lake Tahoe. And I didn't know what a timeshare was or anything else. But I, um, I said, OK. Um, and I'm not sure why I did that, because I rarely said OK to anything my dad told me to do. But that time I said, OK. And um, <laughs> so uh, and then that ended up we ended up moving to San Diego because he has he got an opportunity down there. And, and then I just stayed in San Diego. I never left. Kept going to school part-time. About the third year of selling timeshares and going to school, I met this real estate broker and tried to sell him a timeshare. And uh, he, um, for the next three years, tried to recruit me. Not tried, did recruit me. You know, kept writing me notes, calling me every time I saw him, saying, hey, you should come work for me. You should get into real estate. And uh, one day he caught me on a weak moment. And I said, okay, I'll give it a try. And uh, but I said, I'm not going to sell houses. That's If I'm going to sell stuff, I want to sell big things. I want to sell buildings and, and land. And, and, and I knew nothing about real estate or commercial real estate. But I knew if I wanted to do, if I was going to do something, I want to do it big. So, um, you know, he said, all right, well, pick an area you want to work. And there was this area in Carlsbad near this airport. And I said, there's a lot of industrial buildings. I said, well, that looks like a good area. So he, he gave me this little one page script and he said go out to all the businesses and ask these questions so i'd leave the office i'd get in early 6 6 30 i'd leave the office at seven hit the streets go into these businesses all day long come back at the end of the day and got information on these different businesses. i had no idea why i was asking the questions what i was going to do with the information what i no no clue whatsoever but there were questions like you know uh, how many employees do you have? Do you, know, do you own the building? Do you lease it? Are you going to need more space? And you know, now I know that those were, you know, those were qualifying questions and prospecting type of questions. But at the time, I, had, I didn't know what I was doing. After 30 days of doing that, my, my stand-up cubicle was across from the top agents in the office. And I had bought a townhome the year before, and she farmed my neighborhood. So I saw from a homeowner what she was doing, and I sat across from her so I could hear and see what she was doing. And she was the number one agent in the office, residential agent. I thought, you know what, I could, I could actually do this. So after a 30-day career in commercial real estate, I retired from that and transitioned to a residential, uh, sold 27 homes my first year and was rookie of the year, and, and then just kept going from there. Uh, that first de decade was... At the end of that first year, I hired a, an admin because um, it didn't make sense for me to be spending several hours a day stuffing envelopes or folding letters or doing paperwork or answering the phones. And, uh, and I was young. I was one of the youngest people in the office at that time. And I remember I hired the assistant and the agents were, you know, giving me a hard time. You know, Heller, who do you think you are, the president or something, hiring an assistant? No one has assistants in real estate. And, and I would look at them and go, well, who are you? Who do you think you are? You spend four hours a day folding letters and stuffing envelopes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and that just helped me sell more homes, freed up more time. Um, second year, I hired a showing assistant uh, uh, and someone to prospect with me, and it, it just kept growing and growing from there. Never, never a goal. I will say this, Michael. Never a goal of building a team. A goal of of, of just selling more homes. And as that happened, then I needed people to. To help run and take care of the business. See, and I, I believe that, you know, and, and I'll tell you what I've noticed about you, about not only you, but of, of other really, really high producing agents and team leaders out there is that most of us didn't start off saying, you know, I'm going to go be the number one, whatever, right? I'm not going to be the, the biggest. I'm not going to be the most wealthy or whatever. We just, we're just doing our thing, right? You just kind of go in there, you start working away and then necessity dictates that, okay, well now it's time for me to hire an assistant. And then as, as you grow, necessity dictates that you hire other people to help in other areas. And it just it just happens because that's what's next. It's not necessarily because you're like, wow, I want to have the biggest team or I want to have, you know, this huge ISA team or, you know, whatever. It's just, this is what you do. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people who go start off thinking that way are the ones that 
that tend to fail because they're they're only focused on this one dollar sign. They're not focused on the fact that, you know, our perspective changes. The bigger we get, the perspective of it changes. And it, and it starts off with, man, I've got so much work. I need help. And then it changes to, well, I'm helping and we get this sense of responsibility now that we have these other team members and every person we add on, we think, oh my goodness, I've got a whole nother family that I have to feed also. So it's like there's a continual layer of drive that keeps getting added um, to that outside of just the dollar sign. Well, and I think another thing, Sheree, is that, um, and I've seen this, I'm sure you guys have too, that when agents start off with the goal of building a team and building a big team versus building a business, yep. that, uh, a lot of times they do it at the expense of, of profitability. And, um, and that, that's usually not sustainable. Um, now, there are some that have done it and they've done it at a really high level and have been very, very successful and, and, and they're better than me for doing it. But, the, but for most of us, uh, you know, just focus on building the business and then adding the pieces as we need them and staying profitable all along the way um, is a, is a much, much more sustainable model. And there's a key word that you said there, and it's building the business. And so many people are not focused on this team that as this is the business that we're building um, instead of just chasing you know, the next one over and over again. So that's one key thing that I think a lot of agents miss the mark on and that this is a business that you're building. And that's what your mindset should be behind it when you are adding different key leverage pieces there is that this is the business. So Chris, let me ask you this. You know, when you started off, you did really well as an agent, you hired your assistant and eventually you grew a big team or, and it wasn't a huge team, but it was a very productive team, right? Um, And it was a very profitable team. How did you transition from that? I think this is the question I've always wondered. How did you go from that to, hey, by the way, I'm going to just be a CEO of Keller Williams because, you know, I'm bored. So I'm going to do something. <laughs> I'm like, right. When did bored. you get bored? <laughs> no, no, seriously. Like, well, what happened? And by the way, didn't give up your team in the process, right? You still had no. your team and, and then became the CEO of Keller Williams. Yeah. So here's, here's how that happened. And it was never, um, it was never a goal to become the CEO of Keller Williams. In fact, as an agent, that's something I, I wasn't even on my radar. I'd never even imagined that. Here, here's what happened is I joined Keller Williams and I'd been with Prudential for 16 years. 2004, I joined Keller Williams. Uh, 2006, launched a market center, launched a franchise and, and it became a, a very successful one and still is to this day. And in 2008, I got a call from the CEO of Keller Williams saying, um, you know, for a lot of years, we wanted to expand internationally and we haven't for two reasons. Number one, Gary wouldn't let us until we reached a certain size. And number two, we didn't know who would, who could do it for us. And me and the president were talking and we both, we both said, we know who the right person is. And we both said, who do you think it is? And we both said the same name and it was your name. And, we know you're going to be in Austin next week for this event. And we'd like to talk to you about that to see if that's something you might be interested in. And I said, well, I can tell you right now, I'm interested. I had no idea what, (laughs) what I was interested in. Smart though. I love it. You're like opportunity knocks. I'm going to open the door. I don't know what it looks like yet, but I'm opening the freaking door. It was, um, it was big enough where I thought, okay, this is, this is a big challenge. Like uh, for some reason, and every time I gripe about it, my wife reminds me that I like this. So sometimes I forget I like this. But um, it, just just on just this far from impossible is 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 where I like to to hang out. And it seemed like almost impossible to build Keller Williams around the world. So that was two thousand eight. Um, we didn't yeah, make it real quick before before you move on from that. I want to. Did it scare you just a little bit? Oh yeah. It, it, I mean, it, not only not only was there that but there was um as much as as much as some people don't believe it i am very human and and have the same human thoughts and 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 emotions as everyone else does and there was a lot of uh self-doubt and 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 wondering why they thought i could do this because i don't think i can do this what what do they see that i don't see uh you know and 
Um, and I knew I had a couple of years to prepare. So this was 2008. We were going to start this in 2010. So I had two things I needed to do in those two years. One is I had to set my team up because I had invested a lot in it and, and had a, and still do have great name recognition and brand recognition in San Diego. And I didn't want to give that up. So I had to be able to set the team up to transition out of it. And I had already pretty much limited my activities at that point to the team of lead generation, listing presentations and negotiations. So over those next two years, I replaced those three activities and, you know, trained the person that was going to handle the negotiations, trained the person who was going to be doing all the listing presentations. Um, and then, and then figure out other sources for, for lead generation to replace what I was doing. So in 2000, oh, so the next year, 2009, I became the number one uh, Kelly Williams agent in the world. Um, and, and I'll tell you how that happens. I was actually number two and about three quarters of the way through the year, the number one guy left, left the company. Yes! And, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I ended up being number one, which, um, yeah. That's hilarious. Ben Kinney and I have a running joke. I always tell him the only way he was able to be become the number one agent in Washington State was me leaving the industry. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes you just got to wait for number one to go away for you to That's slip right. into that spot. And there's, a, there's no asterisk next to my name in the uh, Keller Williams record book. So, um, so, the, um, so 2010, I, I uh, go to Austin and start to figure out how we're going to build Keller Williams around the world and uh, spent a, a year, uh, really the first year, just doing a lot of research, um, exploring and working with attorneys almost daily, and then started started building it. I, I think we're, when I left, we were in over 20 countries. And so from 2010 to 2015, I uh, did a lot of international traveling, did a, a horrendous amount of Skype calls at all hours of the, of the, the mornings and evenings and middle of the nights and speaking with people all over the world. And, um, and then in 2015, excuse me, 2014, there was talk with the CEO and the president and with Gary Keller that there was going to be a transition and that the current CEO and president were going to become board members and, uh, they wanted me and another guy to replace them in those roles. And uh, they felt that I would be the, the best candidate for the CEO. So that was announced in January, 2015. And, um, and then I was there till April of 2017. So April of last year uh, is when I left. So learned a lot, had a, it was a great experience. And, uh, and now, ended up at Mellow Home and, and I'll tell you real quickly how this happened because this was nothing planned. When I left Keller Williams, I really didn't know, for the first time in my life, I actually didn't know what I was gonna be doing each day. Um, had my team, but I wasn't gonna go back into production and um, really just got comfortable with being uncomfortable and not knowing what I was gonna be doing. And happened to meet, uh, uh, with the owner of this company, uh, who's a, um, a very dynamic and, and self-made billionaire um, named Anthony Shea. And we met just not about, <laughs> it wasn't even on the radar of me ever joining his company or doing what I'm doing now. It was just, we were, we were just a meet, meeting to talk about the real estate industry. And um, we were both, we were both talking the same way and saying some of the same things. And I remember him saying, hey, we need to spend more time together. When can we meet? When, let's, when can we have dinner? I'd like to spend more time with you. And we did that and met again and met again and met again. And after, well, we met 10 times, actually. After the sixth or seventh one, um, you know, it was like, okay, wait a minute. This is something that, that might be an opportunity and a big opportunity. And ultimately ended up joining him in February of this year. Okay, that's huge. And, you know, I got to think, I mean, obviously, you know, having been the CEO of Keller Williams probably opens a door or two in the industry, I would think. Uh, so that probably didn't hurt. But what I love about this story is that it really was relational. It wasn't transactional, right? I mean, literally, it, you, know, you, you met this guy, you had no intention of doing anything with him, nor him with you. And yet you guys, you started the conversation, you got to know each other over a longer period of time, lots of meetings, lots of dinners, whatever. 
and that's what it takes, right? I mean, it really does take spending some time together. Uh, and and uh, Sharon's asking, uh, and by the way, for those of you that have questions or comments, uh, please type them into the live feed on uh, facebook.com forward slash club wealth. And, um, and we'll, we'll answer your questions live. Uh, but Sharon asks, why did you join? Uh, I'd love to hear that in a second. But I mean, what I'm really enamored with is just that you haven't taken some crazy unusual path on anything in your life. Everything you've done, and this is why you mentioned the comment earlier that, you know, surprisingly, people might be surprised and realize that I am actually human, blah, blah, blah. And, and I think there's a perception out there that Chris Heller is a machine, that Chris Heller is like the ice man and that he, you know, is like Mr. Emotion free and nothing bothers him. And he just is steady no matter what's going on. Nothing gets him worked up. Nothing freaks him out. Nothing gets him sideways. And the reality is, I don't think that's true. I, I think, you know, to your point, you have emotions, you have feelings, you have bad days, you have good days, you have things that excite you, you have things that kind of get you sideways. I want to know, how do you maintain such amazing composure in the midst of all that? And how do you turn that into success? Michael, yeah. hold on. He is a machine if he's Skyping at all hours of the night. <laughs> <laughs> that's, just driven. That is that's just that's just being driven and working hard and working your tail off and that's what it takes in this in, in any industry to succeed it, it does yeah. but i mean but the reality is you do have emotions you do have feelings and so tell, tell us about that yeah you know it's it, it's um it's an interesting thing when i look back and, and you're right there that perception exists i mean i can't tell you how many times uh people would say stuff like oh i've never seen you smile or you're the most disciplined person in the world, or, you know, you're a robot or, you know, this or that. And, um, and yeah, I've created discipline in certain areas of my life. And, and I, um, have a, in certain areas have a, um, have, have developed a, an extremely strong mindset, not in all areas. Um, my four kids will tell you that the, um, or, <laughs> but the, uh, but in, in certain areas and certain business places, I've, I've learned to excel and, and, and do that. There's, um, you know, there are some things that I've noticed about myself and where it comes from. I mean, we could analyze that and that'd be really boring for everyone else. But the, you know, I have, so there's certain things I, I, I do know. I, 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 am, I am a resilient person. You know, I guess I wouldn't say that. I'm, I'm very resilient. And um, so I, I get knocked down like everyone else, but, uh, but there's, it doesn't matter how many times I get knocked down. I will get up with more determination than, than you know, ever. And that resilience, the, the discipline, the drive, the willingness to do whatever it takes, you know, within reason and within, um, you know, what's ethically, ethically right and morally right and legally right. But the willingness to, to do what it takes to, to win and succeed is, is very strong and always has been. So, and sometimes from the outside world, that looks like, uh, you know, that <laughs> you don't have some of the normal human traits that, that we all have. Um, but I, I'm also, as personality-wise, I'm, I'm introverted, so it doesn't show up. I don't show up very, uh, you know, with a with a huge personality or or real sociable. So that probably contributes to that perception, also. You know, I, I think I like the word that you used. You used resilience, and the reason I like that word is because I think so often in real estate, so many people, and particularly people that are struggling with production, they get knocked back, they get knocked down, and I don't care what level you're at. I don't care if you're a brand new agent, huge team leader, CEO of a major corporation. At some level, we all get knocked down at some point. And I think the thing that, that absolutely, without question, separates the uber winners from the people that don't succeed at the level they're capable of is resilience. And, I, and, I, and the, the obvious example to, in today's world that comes to mind is Tiger Woods, right? I mean, here's a guy who's been through some stuff, right? Some of it he brought on himself and some of it became a function of a lot of things that in, in around him that caused him to kind of implode essentially right and so here he was this uber producer implodes and then through resilience and there's really nothing else that can be said about it right 
Nobody else picked him up and made it happen for him. Nobody else forced him to get back on it and succeed. And Mike Novak's like, you're nailing it, right? And But it is true, right? I mean, here's this guy that, I mean, literally was addicted to drugs, you know, was having affairs, was doing everything wrong in his life and having all these challenges. And it affected his problems. He could barely move. His body was broken and beaten and battered. And he could barely do the profession that he was, was had led him to success. Just like, you know, with, with people like you and I, who whether, whether it's big challenges or little challenges, we've decided at some point, you know what? I don't care what happens. I'm going to continue moving forward. I may not leap forward like I used to, but I'm going to keep putting that one foot after the next every single day. And I'm going to make boring success. And yeah. that's really what it comes down to, because for you, would you agree that success for you has been relatively boring? Yeah, I think um, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I, I had a coach years ago who used to use the phrase uh, repetitious boredom, right? Getting, it's, it's this repetitive activities that we do every day that really is boring, right? There's, and, and like everyone else, there were many days, probably more days than not, where uh, I didn't want to do what I was doing. But I would I would acknowledge that quickly and, and keep doing it. Where most people would would if they had the awareness would acknowledge it. If not, they would just react to the want or the don't want and and stop doing it. Or they if they did acknowledge it, then they would listen to it and then you know go do what they wanted to do, which was might have been going to the beach or fishing or shopping instead of you know doing their job every day. Yeah. yeah this morning on our team huddle. This morning on our team huddle, um, I talked to my team about. The fact of how most people think of long races that a lot of people run and how when they realize that someone's already crossed the finish line, they tend to slow up or they just give up instead of just putting their blinders on and keep pressing forward. You know, most people stop right when they're right there at that pot of gold. That's when they stop. That's when they give up. They don't keep doing those things. We've all had things that have given us stumbling blocks. We all have bad days. We all have all of that, but it's just the fact of waking up each day, putting one foot in front of the other. And that's true. I mean, it does get boring sometimes. Sometimes it does. But I always say, whenever I get bored, just click on your bank account and look and see and say, oh, guess what? I need to keep going. I need to keep yeah. going. I need to keep going. <laughs> the, bank, the bank account is a great barometer for that. You know, Chris, I love what you just said because a lot of people are afraid to call it what it is. It, and your bank account really is just that. It's a barometer, right? It's not to be compared against other people. Nobody gives a rip what anybody else makes, or at least they shouldn't, right? But the, and, I, and I'll tell you, the day that I started having the most success in my business was when I stopped worrying about everybody else. And, and for me, it was a guy named John Schlonbush. He was kicking my butt, right? And finally, I quit worrying about John and how well he was doing. And I started worrying about how well I could do and I used my bank account as a barometer. It didn't define me, but it absolutely told me how I was playing the game called life in terms of financial life. Obviously, we, we stand by, you know, what it says on the sign back here. No success in the world can compensate for failure in the home. But that said, go ahead. I want to hear more about the, how you use that as a barometer. Yeah, I think the, um, you know, and, and, and I agree with you totally. It's not comparing yourself to others, but, you know, always looking at what our options are right in any given moment if i if i don't like what i'm doing what's your option you know or looking at you know and i've had had this conversation with many agents on my team and off my team uh you know do you have too much money in the bank right now you know, do you have more money than you know what to do with then why are you complaining or why are you not doing the things you know you need to be doing to, to get to where you want um you know, people, I get asked that all the time. Well, how, you know, how do you stay focused? How do you, how do you prospect, you know, for 27 years straight, you prospected every day, you know, how did you do that? And so it's like, I just did it. Now I didn't think of doing it in terms of 27 years in a row. I just thought about doing it each day, doing my job. And, and every day I did my job because I wanted to achieve my goals and my goals were big enough and important enough to where not doing my job would be more painful than, than doing it. And that's, you know, yeah. and it's got to be something important. And, it, and if it's ego based, it's not sustainable. It won't, it won't get you to do the things you need to do. In fact, you'll can, because of that, you'll keep looking for shortcuts or looking for shiny objects and, and, and uh, undermine what it is you're trying to do. 
I love it. Amanda Thomas and Todd just commented, and I think you know Amanda, uh, Chris. Uh, she just uh, commented. She says, uh, "Flower doesn't look at the flowers around it; it just blooms." So, <laughs> I love it. It's true. Uh, so good stuff. Well, let's get into some more stuff because we've only got a, a, about uh, what are we at? Uh, Thirteen minutes left. Is that right? No, twenty-three minutes left. No, twenty-three. Twenty-three. Whatever. My math's off today. That's all right. That being said, uh, Chris, what I want, what I want, I know seriously, but we still we're running short on time, so I want to get to some of these questions that everybody's been asking. Um, and one of the one of the things that I want to ask you about is, hold on, where did it go? I just lost the question. Um, what do you think about these external players coming into the marketplace, like iBuyers, uh, you know, and, and how do we compete with those as agents, or do we compete with them as agents? Yeah, so um, this is something I've thought a lot about. There's there's a lot of changes taking place right now, and they're changing, and, and it's happening really fast. In fact, it's so fast that I don't know if most people are even aware of it. The source of all the changes is is consumer behavior and and, um, and consumer preferences. You, I, everyone watching, listening, we're all now very spoiled and have expectations that are much different than what they used to be. Right? We want speed. We want certainty. We want savings, and, and savings not necessarily in dollars, but in time or in energy. And we want things very quickly and we expect a certain level of experience. Some of these models that are coming into the industry are being created with that in mind. And as a homeowner, at some point, if I could sell my home without having to put it on the market, get it ready, have strangers traipsing through it and get the best possible price, sign me up. Who, who isn't going to want that? It's not there yet, right? The iBuyers can't do that. They're not going to give me the best possible price. But that's what they're working towards. Now, it's not that every seller is looking for that instant offer, that instant thing, but they're looking for certainty. They're looking for speed. They're looking for savings. Uh, so uh, can we compete with that? Absolutely but it takes us, us doing things at a different level than we've ever done before. You know, the, the uh, customer service is, that's, a, that's, that's the low bar now that we have to be way above. We have to be creating the type of experiences that consumers want. So how do we do that if we're not a big technology company or if we're not funded with, with you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to just buy our clients' homes when they want to sell or if they didn't sell. We do that by offering the same, the same level of service and providing the same things that the consumers want. We're just doing it more in an analog or a human way. Now, we know that people still like the human interaction. You know, on any big decision, people still want to, that, that, that consultative type uh, situation, right? We all... We all could, um, if, we're, or if we're sick or something's wrong with us, we all could go online and find and, and diagnose and research and everything else. But it's important enough where we still go to the doctor and, 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 and want to hear from the expert. And with something as big as buying a home or refinancing a home, people still want that. But they want an experience that's quick, that's seamless, that's hassle-free, that's transparent and so we have to be able to provide that what that means specifically is our clients should never have to reach out to us to get information we should be anticipating their wants their needs their concerns their fears and be providing that and setting the expectations for them at such a high level that we're always a step or two ahead of, of what they're thinking feeling wanting or, or, or looking for uh, the top, top agents do that, uh, they, and they've done that for years. It's now even upping that game to another level. And the, the rest of the agents that haven't done that or don't even think in those terms um, are the ones that are at risk as, as the industry continues to, to morph and grow. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely different today, right? I mean, we can't keep thinking that everything's going to continue to stay the same as it has in the last, you know, however many decades. Things are changing and people's wants and desires and needs are changing and their expectations are definitely changing. So yes. what I'm hearing you say is 
don't be afraid of the i buyers and and you know the, those types of companies don't worry about that don't feel like we've got to compete with them but do start understanding the mindset of the consumer and really start focusing on how do i deliver a better customer experience yeah i, I think i think fear is um is a relatively useless you know <laughs> motion and and causes all sorts of havoc in your head and everything else i mean um you know, having an awareness is important, but then saying, okay, what am I going to proactively do to make sure that I'm providing that, that, um, and I saw this, um, someone used this phrase, this, an Amazon-esque type experience, mm -hmm. you know, where, where we're providing that, 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 that ease of, of, of dealing with us and ease of dealing with the transaction and, and making sure that we're not making it painful. And, and let's face it, it's, Real estate has, has for a long time been a relatively painful process for people to go through. You know, whether it's buying a home, selling a home, financing a home, um, it's there's a lot of other things in life that have gotten a lot easier than that process. So we need to we need to make sure that we're working at it and and providing a level of a customer experience that that is uh, delights the consumers instead of puts mm -hmm. them in pain. Yeah, every, every, uh, think about just about every industry nowadays has some sort of disruptor that comes through, you know, the law industry has those, what is it called? Um, legal zoom or legal something where you can just go online and do it, but that doesn't take the attorney that I can go sit in front of and ball my eyes out and have someone have that human experience there. And that provides a different level of customer service that doesn't knock them out of the industry. What it should do is it should make that person or those attorneys even better at it. And so that's that leveling up that, that you're talking about, Chris. So don't focus on these disruptors that come in, focus on what you can do in order to make your client's experience even better. What can you do in order to prepare them for everything that's in front of them that they're not gonna get from these disruptors that are out there. And that's how you will sustain in this market. Yeah, it's uh, like uh, things are going to continue. Technology and yep, the digital age and is only going to increase at an at a increasing rate. Um, and we have to be able to, to leverage technology and, and use technology for the things it was designed for, which is to make our life easier, better, faster. Um, but at the same time, you know, providing the expertise and and the guidance and again anticipating the client's oh. needs and wants. And, and also doing a better job of setting the expectations so that the, uh, that the experience that they have is, is, is a better experience. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so here's, here's what I wanna know because you know, we're getting lots of questions, but one of the things that Hank Anvik was asking, or, uh, sorry, Avink, I always mispronounce your name, sorry about that, Hank. Uh, but Hank was saying, what do you see uncomplicating the process to allow, and I believe what he's talking about is that 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 fast purchase at that, that top dollar. What you know, what is what do you th think is going to really be the game changer there? The um, you know, it's it's when it's when that service can be provided uh, without the consumer having to bear the cost of it. All right. So, um, at some point, as a, as a seller, let's just look at sellers. I'm going to go, you know, on this side, I have no hassle and certainty and it's easy but it's going to cost me and am i willing or able to pay that cost for that or am i going to you know submit mm -hmm. myself to some of the uncertainty and some of the hassle and everything else to to you know to get more money um when those come in line when the when the costs come in line with with where the market's truly at then then it becomes a real viable option and as agents we have to be able to either figure out a way to provide that or align ourselves, uh, you know, uh, with a, with a company that can provide that or, or do something. But I don't, I don't know that that's going to happen anytime real soon. And the human interaction doesn't change. There's a certain percentage of the, of the population that will always go that route. There's a certain percentage of the population that will never go that route. Uh, and then there's the, the majority in the middle and the majority in the middle is, is where we need to focus on. And those are the clients that, that if we're doing uh, again, 
I, I hesitate to say a great job because it's, it's almost a level above that is, is where we need to be at. Um, and so I don't know if I answered Hank's question, but the, you know, it's the little things that make the biggest difference. If we think about great experiences that we've all had, whether it's, you know, I still fly a lot, whether it's dealing with airlines or a car rental company or a, a uh, Amazon or um, Expedia or whatever, whatever we spend time on, if we think about the things that work really well, that we really like, that we that cause us to go back again and again, um, those things all, you know, revolve around, like I said, the, the certainty, the transparency, the ease of use, the and so we have to make this process of buying and selling a home that way. Well, and I think too, to your point, and and Hank makes the great point as well as Gail Zintek uh, makes the the great point as well that I think that those experiences that cause us to come back over and over and over again, guess what they also involve? They involve a human being, right? They, they generally involve someone. And, and, and I'll give you an example. E even Uber. Let's take Uber for a second, right? If every time I got in an Uber, I had a bad experience with the driver, I would stop using Uber, right? Mm -hmm. So did technology change that industry? Yes. Did technology change the way we interact with that industry? Absolutely. But somebody's driving the car. Now, is it possible that the, when the self-driving cars come out, that now everybody's just going to jump in a car that, that, that won't ever you know, need to have a driver and that that will still provide a great experience for them? Maybe that's possible. I think it's a little different, though, when you're dealing with some of the largest financial transaction most people will ever make in their lives. They want that human interaction. Yeah, we have to, we have to remember it, it is a – buying and selling a home is, is, is a – is a very emotional event and i don't mean emotional uh, like a like a roller coaster i mean it it's a the reasons that people buy and sell their homes are often grounded in in an emotion and in any time you're dealing with something that's emotional it's human interaction and it, uh, is is a key key part of it all right so i want to know about your thoughts because we we're down to about 10 minutes here yeah, I don't want to miss out on this because I know that everybody's asking or wondering what you're thinking about the future of real estate. Like, where's it going? You have done a great job of spotting trends and getting in front of trends and understanding how to position companies to maximize on those or to capitalize on those trends. What's coming next? All right. So we could look at it from a lot of different perspectives. Let's look at it from an agent's perspective first, because I imagine that's um, where most of the interest is in that question. Um, I think there will, will be significantly fewer real estate agents in the future. I think the, there's a lot of parts to what we do that will become automated um, or digitally enhanced. Uh, so just like if we look back 10 years ago at the activities we did every day and how we interacted with people, I mean, some of us have been in doing this long enough where it was pre-internet, where it was pre-cell phone. And we, when we think back to how we did things then and how we do them now, we say, wow, it's a lot different. And it's going to be a lot different in the future. Uh, there's certain things that I don't think are going to change a lot. And that is, you know, the consultative nature of, of the business, the, uh, the, um, you know, the things that people, and I, I look at some of our clients, you have some clients that are highly intelligent, um, highly successful, and they still, they still want to talk and, and get questions answered and, and see if they're looking at things the right way and what else they should be thinking about. And that doesn't, that part doesn't change. So anyways, there's going to be a lot fewer agents. There's going to be a lot fewer um, teams will continue to grow um, out of, a, out of two reasons. One out of necessity, uh, because it's going to be, more difficult for new agents to to generate business because they don't have the resources that, that the teams will and more of the business will be generated online um doesn't mean that that there's not opportunities for good old-fashioned lead generation uh, and in fact it goes in phases where sometimes that comes back at even a, a more effective rate uh, but i think the other the other things that we'll see in the future is um you know new Lots of new players and lots of new models that continue to come into the marketplace um, and new alternatives for buyers and sellers. Uh, that will create a lot of fragmentation, creates a lot of options for agents. We have, we have more options and different options for where we choose to work or who we choose to, uh, 
uh, align with or what company we type of company we want to be with now than ever before. Um, it'll be, I think one of the most interesting things will be that the, as the market shifts and, and I don't know about the rest of the country, although I have a pretty good sense, um, but I know in San Diego, the market is starting to shift in Orange County, the market's starting to shift. And it's a matter of time before we feel that in other parts of the country. Um, it'll be interesting to see what that does, uh, to online lead generation. It'll be interesting to see what that does to some of the new models and which ones are sustainable in, in different types of markets and which ones aren't. Um, I think for us, it's just a matter of, we have to um, keep doing what we do at, at a higher and higher level. I think the other thing that as the market shifts, it's really important for agents to understand what they need to do differently, how they need to act differently, how they need to have a different mindset, how they need to have different dialogues and skills and dealing with buyers and sellers and educating them about the market. Uh, I think the uh, understanding that we have to build our inventory in a declining uh, in a market that's cooling off, um, that we have to get very proficient at our pricing skills, at our price uh, uh, reduction skills, and our, our ed and educating the clients and preparing them um, for making difficult de decisions that at the moment will be uncomfortable, but have them understand how within a few months, they'll be very glad they did what they did when they did it. So anyways, that was a long rambling answer to a simple question about the future. Dude, I love what you're saying though. So here, there's a couple of interesting thoughts that I've got from that. So first of all, you've been echoing what I've been saying forever, which is you guys, teams are taking over. Like it just, it is what it is. And if you think about this and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. I'm gonna say right now, the biggest team in the country has formed and nobody even realizes it. Nobody even realizes that it is actually. Michael, stop talking about my team. <laughs> as much as I would like to say it's Sharice's team, it's not. It's a much bigger team. And they didn't start off as a team. They started as a technology platform. And I think, Chris, you know where I'm going with this. It's freaking Zillow. You want to talk about the biggest team in the country? Look at Zillow, because that's what they're creating. Well, they, yes. And they're not They're not the only one either. Um, you know, look at Redfin. What? Redfin's a big team. EXP is, is essentially a big team. Um, so they're, uh, but yes, absolutely. The, the, the big, the big gorilla in the room is, is Zillow. And, you know, it's funny. I spoke earlier in the year as a conference in San Francisco and gave a presentation and the presentation, I made the comment. It's only a matter of time before Zillow uh, starts to vertically integrate, you know, in, 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 go from a from a lead platform advertising platform and starts to go vertical into some of the different business segments and then sure enough last month they announced you know they now own a mortgage company and and so we're, yeah yes exactly <laughs> and, and if we don't think that they will get deeper into the real estate process then we're all um we're all delusional uh, well, and they, they, they do absolutely and real thread comes in the same thing that you know these companies that we think are just lead generation companies have figured it out they're not just lead generation companies what's the company that uh, real just bought they just bought um uh op city op city thank op you city. Which, yeah. which is essentially the same as agentology right they're an isa company yeah. well why would they do that i mean think about that you know why i mean these guys aren't stupid right they're they're intelligent people that run these companies and they understand that, as we have for years that the team, the model is what's taking over real estate. The thing that they have done better than any of the rest of us is they approached it from a different angle. They started somewhere where they could then get the agents to pay for them to grow their teams. And then they now have started vertically integrating. As you said, vertical integration, first, you know, the first billionaire to vertically integrate was Rockefeller. And that's how he became a billionaire, right? He owned everything. He owned literally every step of the process. He owned it and got paid all along the way. And that's what these companies are doing. So don't hate them for it. Just understand they're running a business and they're responsible to their shareholders and they're accountable to those shareholders. Guess what? They got to do that. Um, all right. So, which is not exactly what we're doing at Mellow Home, but it's there, there's certain aspects of it that, that are very, that run parallel to what you just shared. Okay. Yeah, so, so talk to okay, us. Sure. Yeah, so no, talk to us about Mellow Home. So you left Keller Williams, Mr. And, and wait, hold on, you're no longer there at all, right? Where's your team now? So no, technically my team is still with Keller Williams. I do have uh, a couple Keller Williams franchises. I'm selling one of them right now. And uh, so right now, yes, we're, we're still part of Keller Williams. You did not go to EXP. 
No, I got <laughs> Somebody had to say it. Come on. I mean, everybody's, yeah. everybody's shouting about Kenny X here. Yeah, but go ahead, Shree. Finish yeah. your so, okay, um, so the so CEO of Carol Williams. <laughs> right. I did leave that role. The, um, so Loan, Loan Depot is the, the second largest non-bank lender in the country, the fifth largest lender overall. Privately held company, eight, eight nine years old, um, has gone from startup to where it's at now, which is just this phenomenal run. In talking with Anthony and, and understanding his vision, which was very much aligned with what I thought, and viewed um, is there's an opportunity and the opportunity we saw was to build a single brand for home ownership, a single brand for homeowners to get their home ownerships need, needs met. Just like I can go to Amazon and get all my, my retail type needs met. Uh, if we could build a single brand where a homeowner could finance, buy, sell, protect, improve, maintain their home without having to deal with, with, many, many different companies and many, many different experiences, um, we could do something really special. Now that's a big, that's a big if, right? If we can do that. Um, but it's a big enough one that it's a game worth playing and that's the game that we're playing. So we launched a new company called Mellow Home, a sister company, the Loan Depot. The first phase of what we're doing is we're taking all the Loan Depot customers and leads that we generate. And there's hundreds of thousands of them on a monthly basis. Um, many of which are looking to get financing to purchase a home, the majority of which do not have a relationship with a real estate agent. And we're able to, the ones that qualify, um, can qualify for financing to qualify to purchase a home. If they don't have an agent, tell them about a referral network that we've created through Mellow Home, which is a network of the top agents in the country. And would they like to be connected with a top local agent in their marketplace that knows the market better than others, that has the, the best reputation uh, and that provides a really high level of service. And surprisingly, not really, um, a lot of these customers say, yes, we would like that. So we connect the agent, we have a concierge team that uh, introduces the consumer to the agent and the loan officer, stays in communication with the loan officer, the consumer and, and the real estate agent throughout the process to ensure a great experience. And we're sending referrals of pre-approved buyers that are pre-approved with Loan Depot to agents across the country. They're doing a great job with the customers and getting them into homes and, and paying us a referral fee. That's the first phase of, of what Mellow Home is doing. Uh, we started, I uh, see I joined in February. We sent our first referral in April. We've had hundreds of deals closed. We have hundreds in escrow are in, under contract and more and more every day. And uh, are, are looking to add more agents. Uh, there's, there's many marketplaces where we don't have agents and we get a referral and we have to go find an agent very quickly. But you know, we're looking for, for top agents that are selling ideally over 50 transactions a year. In certain marketplaces, if we need coverage or the marketplace doesn't have that type of volume of business, then we'll lower that, uh, that requirement down to 25 transactions a year. Okay, so Chris, we are officially out of time. We've got to jump on a coach's call right now. With uh, We've got over 60 coaches now at Club Wealth. We've got to jump on a call with all them. They're waiting for us there. That being said, before we do, if you guys would like, and Chris, would you be willing, would you be open to coming out maybe to one of our events and speaking at one of our uh, at one of our events? I, I would love that. I love, it's fun to do. I'm, look, I'm an agent at heart. I like being around agents. I like talking to agents. So um, that would be an honor. I love it. Okay, so here's the thing. So if you guys would like to have Chris come speak at one of our events, type in have Chris speak right into your into your browser right here into your into the Facebook feed right now and we'll make sure we figure out a way to make that work. Uh, Aubrey, if you're listening right now, you need to reach out to Chris. You need to figure out how to make that happen because I would love to hear more from you, Chris. You're a brilliant, man. You're one of the smartest people in real estate. I always say you've forgotten more about this industry than most of us will ever know. And so seriously, love you, love having you on and really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Um, you guys that want, uh, also, if you'll go to clubwealth.com forward slash Chris Heller, clubwealth.com forward slash Chris Heller, we're going to have some downloads there. And if you want to learn how you can get the, you know, get the, um, the, uh, the approval, you know, get approved, you know, go through the application process and get approved to receive those referrals from Mellow Home. Go to that website, go to clubwealth.com forward slash club, excuse me, forward slash Chris Heller, 
and we will make sure that we send you that uh, application information so that you can too can apply. And I'm going to be honest with you, they're looking for ballers. They're not looking for agents that can't close a, you know, a door. Uh, so literally, you got to know how to sell. <laughs> Uh, but that being, look at all these people are like, have Chris speak, have Chris speak. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love it. So hey, I'm Aubrey, like, he's, in, he's in Irvine right now. There's a little thing for you to remember. He's already um, in Orange County. Dude, we got BSM coming up in November. Chris, you and I might have to talk offline about that. Uh, but, uh, so, and by the way, those of you that haven't done so already, make sure that you get signed up for Club Wealth's business strategy mastermind conference. That's at Club Wealth dot com forward slash BSM. We live, the hotel is nearly sold out. Uh, and I can tell you that the event is going to sell out this year. We have well over 100 more people signed up at this point now than we did at this point last year. So make sure you get out there. Final shout out I've got to make uh, is to Wise Hire, our sponsor for the show. We freaking love these guys. They do a great job recruiting for us. So if you guys haven't checked them out already, go to clubwealth.com forward slash Wise Hire or wisehire.com forward slash clubwealth uh, and you get our deal. So final thoughts, you got 15 seconds each. Sheree Benjamin. Oh boy. Okay. 15 seconds. I don't have a lot of time, but I do want to thank you for coming on today, Chris. Um, thanks for sharing your wealth of knowledge that you have um, over the course of years and what's in, at, at our current state right now in the real estate uh, business um, that I think a lot of agents need to hear and they need to also pay attention to. And also resilience. That is one of the key words from today is resilience. So thank you, sir. Love it. Chris, your final thoughts. Hey, just, just thank you, Michael, and thank you, Shree, for having me. It's a pleasure. I hope uh, anyone that's, that watched or is watching this gets some, some value out of it. And, uh, and give us an, an hour or two to get the information on that site. Uh, that's my fault that it's not there already, not Michael's fault. So All we'll right. get that taken care of. Right on. I love it. We'll get that done to, uh, right, right away. So, Chris, if you just want to reach out to Aubrey, they'll do it right now while, we're, while you're talking to them. And hey, everybody, freaking love you guys. We would never be able to do these calls without you. This Club Wealth TV would not exist if you guys didn't show up to watch. Uh, and so free, and we love it when we get world-class agents and, and CEOs and industry leaders like Chris Eller. So thank you guys. And remember, inside each one of you, there's a world-class beast just dying to get out. You got to choose to unleash that beast. So go take a step forward today. It doesn't have to be a world-class step. Just do something to move forward and be resilient. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks again, Chris. Thank Bye. You.